Be honest. How much time have you spent staring at your phone today? And if you're like most people, the answer is too much. Today we're discussing digital addiction with Jenny Ketchum Crooks. She's a licensed clinical social worker, anxiety specialist, and author of Look Up, The 30-Day Path to Digital Minimalism and Real-Life Maximalism. We'll explore how our digital habits impact mental health and relationships and learn practical strategies to break free from the endless scroll. Jenny will share insights from her 30-day challenge and offer actionable tips for creating a healthier relationship with technology. So if you're struggling with screen time, this episode is packed with valuable insights. Let's dive in. But first, this is the FitMass where together we learn to develop habits that help us live beyond our mental health struggles to create happier, healthier lives. He's Zach. He lives in the future with his anxiety. He's Jeremy, and he lives in the past with his depression. And we get together once a week in the present to share the obstacles we face and how we overcome them. Uh, so I'll, I'll start with the confession. I, I'm sure I have an unhealthy relationship with my phone. I know you at least at one point did uh, have an unhealthy relationship with your phone. Maybe you still do. Maybe it's just not as bad. Talk to me about your relationship with your phone and how you got into all this. I mean, look, like I am a human. I have a relationship with my phone and the health of that relationship really waxes and wanes given any particular day. I also have a two-year-old. And so the more active that she is, the more unhealthy my phone relationship seems to be. It's a, it's just such a nice place to avoid my life. It's it's a great escape, isn't it? (laughs) It's a wonderful escape. And it's also a wonderful place to feel like I'm a really good parent as I like buy a bunch of shit I don't need on Target. And so- (laughs) Um, yeah, so current, current phone use is probably somewhere around two hours a day if we're just looking for the objective metrics. Um, yeah, don't know whether that's healthy or not. I'd have to, I'd have to do the lookup challenge again, right? And so, (laughs) um, so how'd we get here? Just real quick, I, I missed my daughter's first steps because I was looking up content about Snooki from Jersey Shore because obviously Uh, it was important and that's what I had to attend to in that meant in that moment so here we are so but as a therapist at the at the time were you a therapist when when that happened yeah so I, I was a therapist at the time and I I realized that I had missed this really important moment and other people were there that saw it which was you know like even more shame sort of showed up like oh my god all these people saw me missing this moment because I'm looking up shit about Snooki. Um, so I was a therapist at the time and I thought there, there's got to be like someone in the field, like some clinical person who has designed some clinical strategy. I'm very solutions oriented. Like there has to be a problem solved for this, yeah. right? Like somebody has to tell me what to do. And it, it can't be as simple as put down your phone because that just doesn't fucking work. Right. And go so, to the gym, eat less, you'll lose weight. It's that simple. Come on, let's yeah, just do it. Right. Just do it. Yeah, just yeah. go. Um, so, so I want something that is evidence-based and like grounded in the scientific theories that I'm familiar with and that I use with my clients, um, couldn't find it and thought, well, maybe I'll just make something. And so I want to get into what the something is, but talk to me about the results. Like, let's kind of give the before and after picture of this. Once you've implemented it, how has it helped you? How has it helped your clients? Yeah, so so implementing this helped me personally because I have I have this huge an improvement and a huge improvement in my awareness around my phone use behaviors, which is actually the first step towards changing behavior, right? Like you have to be aware that you're doing the thing and and also aware of like what is what's driving you into that thing, right? Like are you going towards something that you really care about or are you moving away from something that you that is yucky, right? Like an ick. And so once you have that sort of insight, it allows you to better tune your behavior, right? So I realize when I am in my phone putting, like I mentioned, putting stuff in my target, in my target card, that's usually because I, I feel like I have fucked up as a parent. Yeah. Like that is that is my yeah. like quick go-to, right? It's such an easy way. I'm like, I'm just going to buy her so many leggings that she will never be able to say <laughs> that I'm a shitty parent. That's right. I'm going to buy so many frozen teethers that this two-year-old never loses her cactus again. <laughs> Well, I'll, g- I'll give you credit because at least you're using that time to do something for your kid. I typically will just dive into doom scrolling or whatever turns my brain off and makes me forget the pain for five minutes or, you know, an hour and a half, whatever amount of time happens to it's, pass. Yo, it's no different, though. It is no different, right? Because I don't actually buy them. 
Oh, just, okay. So you're just loading up the cart and then... <laughs> I, I load up the cart and I'm like, whoo, that was close. I was almost... <laughs> and then I walk away from the cart. Because I, I, I'm like, oh my God, Jenny, like... We don't, we have a lot of cactus teethers. Like we have a lot of cactus coolers <laughs> in this house, right? And they're just under chairs and they're like in places, right? Like I don't, I know she has enough leggings, Yeah, you know, no, like course. she has enough, right? And, and I do the inventory, right? It, but it's, it's such a mindless automatic habit just to go in and Pottery Barn Kids is the same thing. I have a lot of furniture in there, which they have furniture. Like we're not sleeping on mattresses in the floor in my house, right. Right? right? Like I don't need any I don't need any more storage. I don't need any more beds, right? But like things just get in it. like maybe one more melamine grinch plate will make <laughs> me a good parent, you know? It's like no, we're going to let that go, right? So I I don't think that the behavior it topographically it looks different. But functionally, it's yeah. doing the same thing. It, yeah. It's avoidance, right? Yeah. It's it's me getting away from some thing that I don't want to feel right now in this moment in my body. It's funny. While I was preparing to talk to you today, I was thinking about my use of, of it in that way and, and using it as an escape <clears throat> and how basically I've done this in my entire life. But, you know, there used to not be phones. That wasn't really a thing. So it used <laughs> to be TV and it used to be video games. And now, yeah. you know, and sometimes it's food. And for a long time, it was, you know, however, however many beers it took to make the, the, the pain go away. Um, but now it is very much that same behavior shifts to the phone. Is that pretty common? Is it, is it just sort of the, an addictive thing that we have? Is there, or is there something unique about the phone that, that makes us uh, more drawn to it for an escape mechanism? Yeah, it's a great question, right? And I think, I think you linking that behavior as the undercurrent in all of those different situations, right? Like all of those different contexts, it's so insightful. It is 100% the same motivation, right? Like we're trying to get away from this thing that's uncomfortable. Yeah. Um, the phone specifically is, is set up like a slot machine, right? And so for those of us who have addictive personalities or who are, have human brains that are, are prone to biases and cognitive slips where we get in to open an email, but suddenly we're on Instagram, like looking at reels, right? Like it's going to pull us in for a longer amount of time than we actually want to be in, right? Yeah. So you don't necessarily have to have an addictive personality in order to get sucked into it. It is designed to suck you in. I mean, think about like what's on your home screen right now? My home screen right now, uh, you know, it's it's the stock Apple screen. Oh, no, actually, I'm on my phone. It's uh, it's a picture of Darth Vader and my complicated relationship with both sides of uh, Anakin Skywalker and Darth Vader. <laughs> Literally my favorite answer that has ever there been you go. populated. <laughs> you want honesty? You got it. I love it. I love it. But what do you feel when you look at that? I feel the pull between the light and the dark, right? I mean, I've, I've fought depression my entire life. I am right now in the longest stretch without it that I've ever experienced in my entire life. And, uh, and I have an awareness to some stuff I'm dealing with right now, honestly, that normally I think I would have hung the depression hat on and said, Oh, I'm depressed again. Here it is. But I'm because I've been so healthy for so long, I can look at it and go, no, a really terrible thing just happened. You're really mm-hmm. sad and disappointed and angry and upset about it. And there's a lot of overwhelm, which leads to that just turn off mode. So like, mm-hmm. I'm just kind of numb a lot. And if I'm not that I'm sad and disappointed. Mm-hmm. And so, the, so I relate a lot to, you know, what we've, if you're a star Wars nerd, forgive me if you're not, mm-hmm. but like the Anakin Skywalker we see in the clone wars is the hero. He's the good guy. He's on, yeah. always fighting the bad guys and winning. The one we see later is the villain who gave into the darkness. I was that guy for a long time and I'm trying to be the young hero only now I'm old. And so it's harder. So I'm kind of doing it backwards, but so that's, that's, it just brings me uh, to my awareness of that dynamic within myself. So beautiful. And there's, there's so much in there that I'm like, Oh God, I really like, (laughs) Oh, I want to, I want to like, I want to like eat that with you. right? Um, (laughs) I just love it. Um, you know, one, just focus on the thing that's right in front of you, Jenny. Yeah, yeah totally. It, it feels good to look at your phone screen. Mm-hmm. It, it's a touch point, yeah. right? It's like, oh, like right now I have, what do I have? I have, this is, this is my daughter. Mm-hmm. Let's see. That's one of them. That's cute. And I could look at that all day. There's another one. There's another one. There's another. And then I would just sit here and tap, like tap. 
tap. Oh, there's both of them. There's the family. There you aren't, go. Aren't they beautiful? Yeah. We we set up our screens with these beautiful, appetitive things, right? Because it's designed to be that. Even the stock footage, that Apple Globe, it's so stunning. Yeah. Right? Like yeah. it's so visually appetitive. Give me more, right? And so then we come back to it. We come back to it because we want another bite. We want more berries. Evolutionarily, we are designed to go out and get more berries because yeah. they're delicious, right? Yeah. And they're delicious so that we go get more of them, right? It's right. this sort of like beautiful relationship. And if we don't know that that's pulling us in, we're way more likely to just sort of like do the mindless tap and then end up someplace where we don't necessarily want to be. Yeah. Um, I, I do want to touch really quick on this depression. Thing. Okay. If you're, if you're of up course. to it. Yeah, let's do it. So... The mighty and resilient Merrimack River, carving through the communities of our great region. My name is Linda Lorden, proud president of Merrimack County Savings Bank. And like the river that serves as our namesake, we're a constant yet ever-changing presence. Because to us, it's bigger than banking. It's about powering communities and putting people first. It's about knowing where you came from and where you're going. That's Merrimack style. Visit us at themerrimack.com. Depression is a, it's a relapsing disorder, mm -hmm. right? It comes up in our life over and over again. I think, I think there's data that says that after we have our first depressive episode, we're 50% more likely to have a second. Mm -hmm. After you have a second episode, you are like 90, 80 or 90% more likely to have a third. And then after the third, it's like, you're fucked. Like, you this live is there going, now. Yeah. You live there. <laughs> this is it. This is, you know. And I, I think what you said about recognizing that there's, there's a thing that happened, Right. And it and it is an event with sadness and with some thoughts and with um, these sort of like old reminders of this person that you used to be. Right. Your ability to see that out here mm -hmm. instead of like have it be like right in front of your face. Right. To like see the world through this. Oh, my God, this is the event that happened. Right. Like yeah. this is. This is the whole world, right? Like what I see you doing is going like, oh yeah, like this event happened and yeah. fuck, it really fucking hurt. It really yeah. hurt. Mm -hmm. That is such a skillful way to move through your life, right? Yeah. And it is one of the reasons, like these glasses are so sticky, right? And so mm -hmm. just what you're doing with, with this really challenging event is the same with the phone, right? Like once you have that awareness, like, oh, when I feel sad, also thoughts about what a piece of shit I am, how hard my life is, how everything is coming to an end, how nothing really matters. That also just sort of comes part and parcel with depression. Yeah. It's the depression on, it's an unhappy package. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. an unhappy meal, right? Yeah. And like, you can't get the unhappy meal without the like angry cognitive French fries that mm -hmm. like hate yourself. Right. And without the very sad, sad apples, right? Like it right. all comes packaged together. And so I just, I want to applaud how you are like witnessing and receiving this event in your life and like just allowing it to be, don't have to fight against it. Yeah. And it's just such a skillful way to move through difficult times. It's interesting. It's come uh, after a lot of, implementing different tools and strategies to, to mm -hmm. land here. But one of them was I, I spent nine months in a pretty intensive program, not, not nine mm -hmm. full months, but nine Saturdays over nine mm -hmm. months in the pretty mm -hmm. intensive program, uh, kind of inadvertently eradicating the negative voices from my head. Like mm -hmm. I literally don't, the soundtrack used to be, you suck, you're not good enough. Mm -hmm. Success is for other people. You know, mm -hmm. happiness is for other people. You're supposed to live alone in the dark and you know, you, you have no value to offer the world. Yeah. That was the soundtrack all day, every day loud too it's loud. all it's all i knew it's all i yeah. knew and so my interactions with other people were very much like i hope they don't see this i hope they don't yeah. see this i hope they don't yeah. see this and any word that came out i don't even know what it was because it was not what i was thinking um but i i mean i specifically remember the last time i thought to myself oh you idiot and literally caught in the middle of it mm. like no you just were rushed and now you're in this bad spot because you made a mistake in a in a rushed panic out the door and like mm -hmm. literally since then the voice is gone so it's allowed this sort of space to be able to look at things and apply what we talk about on this show a lot. The idea of just being curious about why you do the things you do. 
mm-hmm. when you go to the pantry because you know something mm-hmm. tasty in there sounds good are you really hungry mm-hmm. or are you avoiding something are you sad are you upset mm-hmm. or what like if you can just be curious about why do I feel, why am I doing like that curiosity has just been such an empower, uh, such a powerful tool for us, for me and for Zach, my co-host mm. to, to sort of undo a lot of the stuff that we learned as a kid as coping mechanisms. Mm-hmm. And this is the first time that I, I think in my life that I've been able to look at the feelings that feel like this and not just go, it's depression and just go, Oh wait, no, it's, it's something else. Mm. Yeah. What, what, what a beautiful gift to get yeah. to like, um, not just like be free of that voice because it sounds like that thought is still inside you right like it just sort of like this errant thought that bubbled up that was like you idiot right it sounds like you responded to it very differently Mm -hmm. than than you normally do like you didn't put the glasses on and be like oh this is now the world i'm like i'm the idiot like this is like colored by that idiot lens you sort of like you're like ah yeah no we we don't necessarily buy that narrative anymore like this is just a really hard thing. And like, it sounds like you gave yourself a lot of grace right? Yeah. and being, being able to respond kindly to ourselves in moments of suffering. I mean, self-compassion is a critical component of our mental health. Yeah. Right. And like when we can't respond with that sort of kindness in the present moment, um, well, we are just, I mean, hello, depression, like, come on in. Hello, yeah. anxiety. Come on in. Like, I I am prone to perfectionism in in like in like really functional ways, but also in really dysfunctional ways. Yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Like totally. if I can just like make every part of my life amazing and perfect, and be the perfect parent, and the perfect spouse, and the perfect wife, and still a like total sex icon, but don't be too sexy, right? Because you're a fucking therapist, you <laughs> know? Right. Like, right. like kids all Goldilocks all the time, right? Like it, it gets really hard to exist. Yeah. When like I'm following all those rules, right? Yeah. And like if I can like see those rules and be like, oh man, like that's a nah, that's a that's a really tight tight rope to mm-hmm. try and walk across a big Grand Canyon. Like maybe maybe we could just like I don't know, take a break a little bit. Like maybe yeah. you can just like I don't know, be be a, a mediocre parent today, like. Right. Just keep them alive, you know, like, let's right. just, let's keep them alive today. And that sort of kindness is just transformative for us. Yeah. Yeah. Like the comfort of that space, like that, I was oddly more comfortable in, in the pain and the darkness than, yeah. you know, than, so this is all still relatively new to me, but we're talking about phones and your book <laughs> and stuff. So I want to try and get that back to, <laughs> that's what we're doing here. Uh, so, uh, I think we, I hope that that sort of tangent uh, can sort of highlight the escape that we all yeah. do, right? Whether it is anxiety, yeah. depression, yeah. bad day, like whatever, we all use the device for that thing to some degree, I would imagine. Even except, for the, except for like the four healthy people in the world that can somehow like put it down appropriately. And you know what? Fuck them. That right? That's what I say. <laughs> That's what I say. <laughs> I'm sorry. They'll, they'll nev- Don't really fuck you. Please, yours, by the- so they'll knows? never be my client. <laughs> fuck them. <laughs> All right, you've come up with a formula. What's the form? The curriculum. The what? What is the thing? What do we call it in, in uh, professional terms? Like, so I can sound like I know what I'm saying. Oh gosh, the what is the formula? So the formula for like uh, for the book, you mean? For for a relatively healthy relationship with my phone. Mm, yeah. Um, intentional, right? Here's here's the recipe. You want to be mindful when you're using it, right? So active, open, aware, non-judgmental, right? You want to be intentional. You're choosing how you use your phone, and you also. I mean, I think if you do those two things, if you're mindful and you're intentional about it, then a lot of the ways in which the phone sucks you in are going to get short circuited. Yeah. So on the intention thing, there's a phrase that I hear everyone use. Tell me. I just need to. Oh, it's compelling, isn't it? I I just need to text this person. I just need to post this. I just need to put this on Snapchat. I just need to update my face. I just need to. We have convinced ourselves that whatever crap we need to put out into the world for four people to read needs to happen right now. So... So mm-hmm. with intention, I think people would say, oh, but, but I need it for work. I need to post the latest mm-hmm. podcast clip that I have. I need to send mm-hmm. this Slack message. I mean, unless you're like a doctor or, you know, in charge of some sort of a rocket launch or something, yeah. you probably don't need to do it right now. So 
Do, do you see that a lot with your clients where it's like, oh, but, but I just need to. Yeah, this, this, this sense of urgency, right? And, and the phone really lends itself to that, right? And the, the structures that we've created both in the phone and in our interpersonal relationships reinforce that. Right, like the read receipt. Somebody see somebody somebody can see the second that I read it. Like, oh God, yeah, yeah we're turning that off, right? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. I, th- I think I think that that phrase. Oh, I just I need to. It's such compelling content in our heads, mm-hmm. right? Like, I, I call my mind Brenda. She's a sort of unhelpful secretary. She does her best, but she often misfiles things or like doesn't file them at all, and just like stands in my head and waves them at me. And like, she is fairly certain that I need to do a lot of shit. (laughs) I think you should fire her. I think you could find somebody better. Good luck. (laughs) I can't. She's, she's it, right? Like she's in there. I can't get tenure. There's nothing you can do. She's She's got tenure. I used to drink a lot of Jack Daniels to try and quiet her. Right. But then, you know, I would do things like, well, no, I do need one more line of cocaine. That'll definitely help. Right. Like. Right. Like it's the right. same, that same, like, I, I need, like, if, if there's this sense of urgency that you're feeling about using your phone, see if you can be curious about that. Right. I actually, in the book have, um, I, I, I called it a quizlet. I was thinking of like a little pink pig with a curly tail. It, it's totally not a clinical thing, but the quizlet helps you determine whether you are on call, right. Which is what you're, talking about specifically with like physicians some of i I work with a lot of people in tech who are on call right and if something breaks yeah then the expectation is literally that they like deal with it that second yeah um so it it helps you determine if you're on call if you're smartphone dependent which isn't talking dependence and abuse in the like chemical world are very different than like dependence and abuse in the smartphone world dependence in the smartphone world is like is this your only access to internet? Is this your only access to a phone, right? Like these mm-hmm. sort of like very utilitarian devices. Yeah. Um, and then addiction, like actual addiction, right? And if you have this like sense of urgency about responding, that's worth being curious about because that leans more into the addiction side of the world. It also might mean that you're like really socially anxious, right? Like, what are they going to think of me if I don't respond in that in that precise moment, right? This like really heavy fear of judgment or of letting people down, right? Maybe there's some depression wrapped into that. Those thoughts that like, I'm going to let down my friends, my family, maybe that comes up. Um, so yeah, so if I think if you feel really pulled and you have that like that thought, like I need to do this right now, like mm-hmm. that's worth seeing and noticing and and being curious about and maybe even experimenting with right like what happens if you don't yeah what if you don't yeah i i love that tactic for so many things what if i just stopped doing this thing what Mm -hmm. would like the world's depending on me doing this what if right now you don't let's just see what happens wouldn't that be weird um so clearly plenty of adults have these problems uh, my daughter has had a phone for a couple of months. We had a situation where she could have used it for good. Instead, she used it for evil. Uh, how... I love her. <laughs> I love her already. <laughs> right. I mean, she's 13. This is what you do. Yes. So first of all, 13, a little early, but for her, it's been a huge um, game changer in terms of social connection. She's been able to actually make friends in real life mm-hmm. through the device. So, uh, so I, I love social media and phones for using them as a tool to connect in real life. Mm -hmm. Other than that, they kind of don't really uh, serve a lot of good from from my point of view. Um, So how do we teach our kids to find that line between using it uh, as a tool and using it as as an addictive um, uh, pacifier? Yeah. Yeah. One, we have to model it. We have to model the behavior because they're learning how to use it from us, right? Like my two-year-old... And, and they can't see what we're doing in there. So it's, it's tricky, right? Like, but my two-year-old has already identified that my smartphone is a very important thing to me. So she will, if I don't have it in my hands, she will seek it out and she will bring it to me, which I'm like, fuck, Jenny, like, <laughs> fuck, <laughs> you're fucking this up, yep. you know, yep. which goes back to that whole like self-compassion, like, listen, mm-hmm. Jenny, you're doing the best that you can, you know, and I think 
if we can model the kind of relationship that we want our kids to have with it, then then they start to learn in the same way that we model um, like financial health and like how to spend money in a way that like aligns with our family values in the same way that we model how to exercise in the same way that we model how to teach uh, or how to, how to treat our, our partners. Right. And so w- with kids, I think, I think you're probably don't, I think you can give yourself a little bit of grace. Um, there was a study out by a uh, global minds project that shows, so, so we're, we have now officially the first group of adults who've had access to smartphones through the entirety of their lives, right? Which I know, right? That's like, weird. Yeah. It's wild. And so what the data shows is that the younger your kid is, uh, when you give them a smartphone, the more mental health issues that they have as an adult. And one of the really alarming things was they have higher thoughts of suicidal ideation, higher incidence of like body dysmorphia, men are more prone to aggression, right? And so um, the study actually tracked kids getting smartphones as young as six years old, which is just to say, Jeremy, like 13, you're doing fucking great, brother. Like you, yeah. you did good. You held off a long time. We, we had to fight and fight and fight. We wanted to do 14. We wanted to do high school, but yeah. there's a lot of stuff at play that, that made us cave. And for the most part, it was going well <laughs> until recently. Well, I mean, like it's a learning opportunity. Yep, exactly. Right? Like. Yeah. I don't think that there is a human in this world who has managed their finances perfectly from the get-go, right? And like our jobs as parents are to be their little prefrontal cortex because their little prefrontal cortex is just mush and isn't developed yet, right? And so like what a brilliant opportunity for you now as a parent to get to show up in her life and be like, oh, yeah, you kind of shit the bed with this. Like, <laughs> I, <laughs> I think those are the exact words I used. Like, you really shit the bed with this. Like, we gave you this really nice thing, and you kind of uh-huh. shit the bed with it. And, like, yeah. <laughs> and to get to model how to be really kind and firm, right? Yeah. Like, that thing that, like, I, I don't think I necessarily got that as a kid. And so, the, I mean, a lot of my perfectionism shows up there, right? Where it's yeah. like, get it right. Never make a mistake. It's like simmer. Like Brenda, yeah. like, please just like, just, yeah. I got it, babe. Like we're going <laughs> to, we're just going to fuck up a little bit. We might shit uh-huh. the bed. Like we've yeah. got plastic sheets. It's okay. <laughs> like we can come back from this, you oh, know? So great. And so for like your kiddo, like, great. She shit the bed. How are we going to move forward together yeah. and prevent bed shitting? <laughs> Everyone deserves to be connected. That's why Cox offers a range of high speed internet plans that fit any budget. Stream, chat, and stay connected at an incredible price. It's fast, reliable internet for everyone. You're probably thinking, wait, what? But yeah, it's true. Learn more at cox.com slash ACP. Non transferable one per household. Application and eligibility decisions are made by the FCC. Other restrictions apply. So let's so let's talk a little bit about sort of the the simple one two threes. I, I have a problem. I, I can't put mm-hmm. my phone down for whatever reason. Either mm-hmm. either it's uh, I have to. I'm on call. I'm addicted. Whatever it might be. Mm-hmm. What are some of the ways I start to put the damn thing down and reengage with real life? Mm, beautiful. So so the the book actually lays out thirty different days of different interventions, right? And they build on they build on themselves on each other and help you behave more flexibly with your phone. So what you're really talking about is like flexibly behaving with your phone. Like how do I be flexible with this shiny, yeah. beautiful rectangle in my hand, right? Yeah. And one of the early interventions that I love is I, I, I call it a five, uh, a round robin, right? It's a five senses round robin where every time before you open up your phone, Take 30 seconds and pay attention to each one of your senses. So 30 seconds attending to sound, 30 seconds attending to sensation in your body, 30 seconds attending to smell, right? Like each of the five sensations and just go through each one and and then go into your phone. It's this anchoring moment, right? Like what is happening right now in this world and, and really what am I choosing to go in there and do, right? So then that, that small moment provides you with a little bit of space to make a choice about how you move forward right and all this is really about you getting to like 
find that space so that you get to make that choice, right? Like, how am I going to use the phone right now? And if you don't have time to do a like little three minute meditation before you get into your phone, before you have to do something else, you actually don't have time to get in your phone at all. Right. Right. Like yeah. don't fucking open your phone. Like just don't, <laughs> right. just do something else. Right. Like, <laughs> so it's, it's a good measure, right? Like I have a lot of my clients who are like, oh, I don't have time to meditate 20 minutes in the morning. And I'm like, oh, babe, then you're going to need to meditate 40 minutes if that's right. true, right? right? Like you're going to yeah. need even more. Yeah. Um, what so I love it, about this too thing. is like, it's not just the phone. Like th- that applies to like any decision you're about to make or any action you're about to take. Like yes. we, we are constantly, just in my head, I see people do this I, and, and I, I live there sometimes myself, <clears> just <throat> swinging vine to vine. Just grab <clears> the next one, swing to the next, grab the next one, swing to we never just get off the damn tree and look around to see that we're you know, in a beautiful forest. Yeah. And, and then like, or even just like swing on that same vine, just a couple yeah. swings, right? Like what a gift to get to pause. You're so right. It, it, we are moving so fast, so fast. And like, this thing is going to be over, right? Like, I know you can't see it because I just got my Botox done. And it looks pretty good, right? <laughs> <laughs> but, like, it, the rental unit is getting older. Mm-hmm. And, like, I see it I see it more in my kids, right? Because they're growing faster. Yeah. And, like, and I also see my face all the time. So I sort of habituate to that. But, like, this ride is going to come to an end, mm-hmm. right? And do I want to spend the whole thing chasing and running and, like, catching up? Like, can I just sit for like one minute and just be here? Yeah, absolutely. We're going to sit. We're going to be. What's <laughs> what's maybe two more things that we can do when we're done doing nothing for three minutes? So two more things you can do when you're done doing nothing. Um, fun, a fun intervention. It's my husband was like, this is I fucking hate this, Jenny, but all right. Um. So it's called point and call. So one of the interventions that I introduce, it's called point and call. And what it is, is it's a a Japanese OSHA safety standard that the train conductors use, right? And so they actually like narrate all of their behavior as they're doing it. So just for a single day, experiment with this. Narrate everything you do in your phone. Jenny's mm. picking up the phone. Jenny is flipping the phone over. Jenny's waiting. Oh, Jenny just got a email. Jenny's swiping up. Nope, that didn't work. Okay, Jenny's clicking into Google right now. Jenny's <laughs> scrolling through her insurance. Jenny is getting really annoyed at this whole process. Jenny's going to click out of that. <laughs> There's not actually anything Jenny needs to be doing. Jenny's going to put the phone down and pay yeah. attention to right here. So it, it gives your brain a moment to like recognize, right? It's this really like intentional mindfulness practice for like, what am I doing right now? Right? Like, what am I intending to do with this thing? And am I actually staying on task? Right. And it, there's a good chance you'll just drive yourself nuts and close the phone. Right. Cause it's, it's pretty obnoxious. Yeah. Right. But if you don't, if you have a task in there that you actually need to do and you don't want to make a mistake, it's actually a really helpful strategy to help you stay on task yeah. because it's making your mind n- like note and attend to the thing that you're doing without getting sucked into the beauty that is the shiny rectangle. Yeah. And it's actually one of the things that keeps uh, accidents in Japan train conductors' lives at like an all-time low. They just like zero people hurt for many, many years, right? Like they yeah. do great in terms of safety. And it's largely because of this. How many things do we do on autopilot every day while we're thinking about anywhere? Like how many car accidents would be avoided if we all just narrated our <laughs> drive no matter where we're going? A hundred percent, right? Like when, when I was driving to the office, I would. it's a good 20 minute drive into downtown Seattle. And I would 20 get 20 minutes? My- you must live like really close. <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm out in West Seattle, so I'm, I'm super, I'm super close. So it was close when the bridge was open, but then it went down, and then it turned into an island. Anyway, if you don't live here, <laughs> right. you don't know about it. But um, yeah, I would, I would get in the car, and I would turn on something, and then suddenly I'm pulling into my, and I'm like, holy cow, here we are. Okay, yeah. great, great yeah. news. Um, yeah. So, so again, that that like mindfulness um, is, is a huge thing. Uh, another intervention that I really love is, um, so just like I've named my mind Brenda, right? And, and that gives me a little bit of distance. Yeah, it's I love like, 
Yeah, like when 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 I don't know that it's Brenda, I'm just looking at the world through the glasses, right? And right. then when I take them off, I'm like, oh, Brenda, you <laughs> <laughs> sweet old girl. Like, what what have you been up to in there? Like, you're making a lot of paperwork for us, aren't you? <laughs> you touched a lot of files today, Brenda. Um, so, so another strategy that I introduce is to name your phone. Mm-hmm. So my phone's named Jolene. Okay. After the Dolly Parton song, Uh right? Like, please don't take my man because she just takes (laughs) my time. Uh My, uh, the intervention in in Look Up, it's actually called um, Meet Sauron because my little sister named her phone Sauron after Lord of the Rings. This like ever present eye that is always looking for you and waiting and will suck you in the moment it can. That's brilliant. I love that. So, so there's, there's a bunch of little fun interventions woven all throughout the book and all of them help you improve your ability to attend to the moment flexibly, help you clarify your values, what's really most important to you, and then help you like be in that choice point where you get to decide like, okay, like I have a little bit of breathing room here. I'm still hanging, still swinging on this vine. Mm -hmm. Where, where do I want to go next? I love it. Where can I pick up my phone and look for the book and uh, follow you on social media and all of that? <laughs> I love it. You can pick up your phone right now and, <laughs> and order the book on Amazon. It's Look Up. Um, you can follow me on social media at the West, at West Coast Anxiety. So that's on Instagram. Or you can follow my personal account. I don't know. I don't really do much there. But, you know, mm-hmm. I don't know. I talked to a brand manager. They're like, you should do something. And I'm like, fuck my life. All right. Like, <laughs> that's what I need to do on my phone is come up with a whole separate brand and keep it updated. 100%. So yeah. you can follow me at, I think it's, I think it's Jenny Ketchum or it might be becoming Jenny. Anyway, you'll find it. You'll find me. And we'll have the links and all that in the show notes here. So yeah, you can find exactly. it there as well. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much for your time. This is a lot of fun. I really appreciate the time and uh, say hello to Seattle for me. Thanks, Jeremy. We miss you. Come on back anytime. (laughs) My thanks to our guest, Jenny Ketchum-Crooks. She's the author of Look Up. You can find links to her and that book in the show notes for this episode at thefitmess.com. And that's where we'll be back next week with a brand new episode. Thanks so much for listening. We know this podcast is amazing and it doesn't seem to lack anything, but we need a legal disclaimer. Prior to implementing anything discussed in this podcast, it is your responsibility to conduct your own research and consult your physician. You should assume that Jeremy and Zach don't know what they're talking about, and they're not liable for any physical or emotional issues that occur directly or indirectly from listening to this podcast.